If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Who do we have in the house lately, man? We had uh, John Wolf. Ah, uh, oh, he's a great guy. I man. really like John yeah. Wolf. John's um uh he's cool. He's from the I didn't realize he's from like kind of around here, right? He's from Salinas. Yeah, our neck of the woods he started out, which was uh yeah, I don't think any of us knew that. No, super cool guy, super smart dude, very interesting story. Yeah. He went into uh his child <laughs> it's actually pretty interesting. I don't want to give away his story, but it's uh pretty insane. And then uh, what's most insane about it is he's like the coolest guy ever. Hmm. And when you hear a story, he's got every reason to be. I'm going to go ahead and say he may be one of my favorite on it people. Dude. Probably. Yeah. I think he, yeah. You know, he's up there he's with up Kyle. There, yeah. yeah I got a lot of love for guys. Kyle because Kyle was our boy yeah. before on it. And so right. I don't know if he counts. Like he's not mm. like somebody. We Kyle met. special is different. Right, yeah. right. He's he, he's in his own special class. But John may be one of my favorite people that I've met over at on it so far, man. Yeah. Really, really good. Our people. Right, he's, yeah, a, he's, he's a good he's dude. He's one of our people. Yeah. He's the CFO uh, at on it, the chief fitness officer. I don't know that that was a is yeah, that a they, thing? They, why yeah, not? I love these titles. They, why they not? If you have a financial officer, why can't you have a fitness officer? Why? You know what? More 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 businesses need us that type of CFO, a chief fitness officer. Right, right. They got they might have the financial well, guy, but they got the nobody nobody's he's, staying healthy. He's definitely the guy. Right. If you were gonna if you were gonna have someone do that, that would be the dude for sure. Uh, on Instagram, you can find him at Coach John Wolf. Uh, and also, I do want to uh, mention, there's only four days left for our promotion this month. That means that you only have four days to get free forum access to our Mind Pump private forum. In order to do that, you have to enroll in any MAPS bundle. Now, bundles are where we take individual MAPS programs and combine them together like MAPS aesthetic and MAPS performance. We combined those together, added some modifications, and made it the Sexy Athlete Bundle. That's just one example. Mm. We also have the Super Bundle, which is a year of exercise programming. And what we do when we combine them is we discount them, like 20%, 30% off anyway. You also get free forum access on top of that. Um, if you want individual Winning. programs... Yeah, exactly. If you want individual <laughs> programs, you can find all those also on our website, mindpumpmedia.com. So just go there, check them out, pick one. Go check out YouTube as well. I wanted to mention, like, we did a couple videos with John Wolf, and he is a master of wielding the mace bell around and the iron club. Yes, so dude, he drops We got some, some great content. Great uh, coming tips. In hot. Great uh, knowledge when it comes to all the unconventional lifting, right? right. Excellent. Dude's so badass. without any further ado, here's Mind Pump interviewing John Wolf, Brooklyn. Chief Fitness Officer of On It. You guys don't sell any programs right now? It's all classes? Is that how it's all structured? Or Yeah, I mean, as a matter of fact, the, the reality is the only way we deliver that type of content is at the gym right now. And, you know, that's not scalable. You know, mm. originally we thought, oh, you know, sometimes you see what's already done in the marketplace and you get stuck in trying to recreate what other people have done. So originally some of the ideas that came up were, affiliate gym type models or things like that. And we realized like, man, that's, that's not us. You know, why, why would we recreate what's already out there? I came in and I wanted to create content in terms of info products, a variety of different types, but then the, uh, the business was already well established in the hard goods, you know, the, the, the physical pieces of equipment and, and then the supplements. So everything was about these tangible goods. And we started selling digital downloads of products that, that we sourced from other people, but the way that they were delivered was you know, just to be honest, subpar. Mm. So the experience of consuming those items wasn't enjoyable. And with a brand like on it, I think that the consumer experience is a big, a big part of the process, the way it feels to consume the items. You know, you look at the, uh, like they just did these huge label redesigns, which, you know, since I've been there three and a half years, we've re redesigned all the labels multiple times. And each time is this huge project, oh, man. you know, but I was busting Aubrey's balls about that one. Did yeah. you, or did you listen to the episode where you interviewed him? Nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause yeah, I was talking about like some of the like hardest decisions that he's had to make. And he brought up the labels. I'm like, what labels? Like the, <laughs> the fuck you guys having a hard time with labels over there? What's going on, man? It's a, I mean, it's a lot of, it's a huge project. It's all your products. It's huge. I mean, that's, what you have to realize is too is uh, one of the challenges is there's, there's this uh, perception of abundance when it comes to on it right and and there is abundance there's uh, so much goodwill um, you know Aubrey's message of, of of servitude and and the balance of 
of giving a little bit more than we take, even though we're, we're a premium brand and we're not cheap. Mm -hmm. The goal is always to give just a little bit more to our community members than what we're taking out in the bank, you know? And so, and, and that goodwill, that reciprocity, law of reciprocity kicks in everywhere we go. But um, at the same time, it's all one pool of resources mm -hmm. right now. You know, we haven't, we haven't scaled to the point where, you know, there's this division and it has a fixed set of resources. Everything gets pulled together and, and when it's when it's managed that way, you know, when big projects come up, um, like Aubrey's book, you know, that that's a big deal for the whole company, even though it's really his personal brand. He's the tip of the spear for right. for the company itself. So a lot of resources go there. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, up to this point, we never really transcended into a, a real digital delivery type of business, you know, uh, whether right. it's programming mm. or mm. or video content. So you never really had the resources to kind of fund that direction yet. Not yet, but thankfully we're about to bridge that gap right now. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So, um, we we saw a huge opportunity in the marketplace with with the goodwill we have, with the large community we have to do something that is a little more consumer friendly. So, in that in that way, you know, a lot of the content. So we were, you, we were talking about like, hey, PDF content programs. You know, you, you have to have a an audience that's somewhat educated and self-motivated to utilize that form of content. Right. And so, so what, what we decided to go in on in terms of our first big content project is something more consumer friendly, follow along uh, transformation program, ah. like a disruptive mm. version of a transformation program. So a la beach body, you know what I mean? Got it. Right. Got it. But, but an on it, an version, of, version that. of that. Right, you know? right. So yeah. it has the mindset component, the the nutrition supplementation, biohacking, right. um, and then a more <clears throat> longevity focused deliverable that can be repeated over time with less wear and tear. So that's my my contribution. But it's been a all hands on deck project, which is really cool because then we get to pull those resources for one common project instead of all the departments working independently. We're like, oh shit, all hands on deck. Let's all work on this one project together. And then we can get a big push and that forces us to kind of evolve the way we deliver digital content. Yeah. How did, how did on it find you? Like, how did you guys meet? Did you meet mm -hmm. Aubrey before? I mean, how did that all happen? Was it burning man? Burn. Oh man. I haven't <laughs> been a burning man yet. Hey, are you guys going? Uh, we, no, we, no, we, we haven't been about yet. it yet. Yeah. We want to go. We I, talk about it every year. I, I feel like I talked to Steven Kotler. Doug's like, been okay, twice. Maybe. It reminds oh, me of what, it's like one of those things yeah. where it's like, it, like I want to go, but then now everybody's gone and like, I don't want to go anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like everybody's done it now. Everybody did it. It's not cool. I mean, I don't need it to be cool. I need a whole bunch of homies show me what's up. Yeah. I want to go into Thunderdome. That's how I, that's how I want to go. I want to go with a big group of people. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't want to just roll out there by myself. I don't need to get high that bad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can do that at home. Right, right. I can do that, I can do that at home. So how did you guys come together? How did that happen? You know, it's, it's really just, uh, I ended up being, you know, the the best choice on the, what did you say, the, the top of the short list. You know what I mean? So uh, I had a gym. Hey, an hour down the road in Salinas, California. The oh, no way. shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. You Get the fuck out of here. You're a local guy. I didn't, Wait, hold, know that. Hold I didn't know that. Hold on a second. You look really familiar. How long yeah. ago? Oh, man. So I opened up my gym December 2010, December 1st, 2010, and then I moved out to uh, work at Onnit August 2014. Did you grow up in Salinas? I grew up in Marina. Marina. Mm. Seesaw. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Seesaw. <laughs> I, I used to manage the 24 Santa Cruz. So, yeah, I used yeah. to manage the 24 Fitness on in Salinas, but a long time ago. No shit. Okay, yeah. that's where you would know me from. So I would come in late night. I used to work hotels. So I would work from 3 to 11 and then I, I was would commute to to Hartnell. So this was probably let's see 90 Eight, oh 99. shit! Yes. That's exactly wow. why you look familiar, dude. Man, hey, give me some. Yeah. Bro, <laughs> I used to. That's when I. That's the first, the very first club. So I was 19 years old. So it's probably 98. You know, 99. That's the first club that I ever managed, and that they, they gave me that one, of course, because it's in Salinas. And they're like, all right, try this one here first. Yeah. If you do well, we'll give you the bigger ones. I knew it because I saw him. Like this dude looks familiar. Man, I was probably like. 19 years old at the Same time right, right, yeah right. man I, I, we probably bumped into each other and hung out a couple of times that's but wild. that's that's a, that's a while back and uh yeah so i would get in there after my 3 to 11 shift and then train until you know almost one go home crash till six and then drive up to milpitas to go to healed i was getting electronics technology my aas that was my first oh. uh degree oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. good deal but, but all this place is hey, by the way on the way here, so sidetrack, you know, we'll talk about how I found it and on it found me, but um, 
I drove in and instead of exiting the Alameda, there was a shit ton of traffic on the 880. I stayed in Fremont. So I'm driving down. I'm like, oh shit, I used to work in hotels. So I used to work in the hotel right over here. It just got open for a while. I did night audit. And then I was driving down and said, oh, hey, reroute, First Street. So I'm driving down First Street, turning right on a heading. Yeah. I'm like, oh shit. I've, I've spent the night in this jail before. <laughs> Bad memories. <laughs> like, yeah. no, I mean, it was good memories because it, it gave you perspective. You know? yeah, 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 <laughs> sleeping yeah. on a metal bed. Yeah, right, right. Uh, Life's bucket. changed quite a bit. <laughs> with, with a Things folded up blanket up as a pillow. You know? <laughs> like, uh, I'm a pillow person, man. You know, I want a cold pillow. A folded up blanket never gets cold. Do you know cold. what a huge market Damn. the pillow industry is? I was just talking to our, our marketing team and they have, obviously they work with other companies besides just us. And he was telling me that he just let go of this company and that the, the pillow industry is like one of the biggest it's a really he told me like per month there's like three million searches for pillows man i didn't even know that was that yeah, big i didn't know hilarious. it was an industry like that pillows are that fucking big of a deal i'll tell you what if i come over to your house and i like your pillow better than mine i'm gonna buy i'm gonna buy a whole new set of pillows it's like, true though just, right yeah yeah, yeah. And, and, we've, and, we've all stayed at like a hotel and you felt like that oh my god that pillow was amazing where were we we just stayed at a house where we were all jumped and they had oh, great yeah. beds yeah we were all that like <laughs> makes yeah that makes the sleep for me for sure <laughs> and this shit's not cheap no. you know a new mattress new pillows that shit's not cheap no, not at no, all no no at all but so 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 okay you you start off you're in the, you're in the bay you're in Salinas area what does your fitness journey look like to get you to where you get to buy a gym you you're running your own gym okay hey they, this is a you know I think in the fitness industry maybe more people relate to this story than not but maybe it's not necessarily something that people share publicly but I, I got into fitness as a a way to improve myself when I was in my lowest point in life. Right. Oh, so, yeah. hmm. so I used to run the streets and I was a street pharmacist that partook quite often of no my shit. goods. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, smoked a lot of weed, did a lot of ecstasy. Right. And so in that time I was experimenting with every other substance as well. And all of them, they all fit together in my lifestyle pretty well. I had a good way to manage it all. I was still working full time, making good money and, uh, Inside sales at this company, this telephony company, at Hello Direct, off of uh, in South San Jose, right there. What's that first exit? I forget. Whatever the case is, yeah, Cottle, Bernal, over there. Cottle. Yeah, Bernal, it's, it's right over there. Bernal, yeah. Bernal. Oh, okay. Yeah, right off Bernal. So it's like right at we that all first exit. Around there, yeah. Oh yeah, you did too. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool, we man. Yeah. Gym down there. Yeah. Yeah. I see this. Uh, this story. <laughs> I know. We're, we're, we're hey, in the same I, place. I feel like I feel like I bought drugs off you back. You may have. You may have. Um, That's how I know you. Yeah. yeah uh, you all look familiar. As a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. Some of my best customers over here. My eyes were crossed when I saw you last time. So I just got to do that again. Um, so, but in any case, I was managing it pretty well. And then, <clears throat> hey, man, I just fell into this this rut after uh, a couple series of uh, deaths in the family. My grandmother died. My grandfather died the, the year to the day. After that, my uncle committed suicide three months later after we hung out and we talked and he kind of told me he was going to do it. Oh, sure. And we, we were like, I was like, man, you know, I, I can't rob you of free will, but I wanted to give you this perspective of like how much you're loved and needed. Mm. And it, it all fell apart. And after that, you know, I was just like, hey, fuck the universe. Fuck life. Fuck. Uh, I don't give a fuck about me. You know, so how old are you at this point? Man, 20. So I was already graduated from healed. I was going to Menlo commuting for, I was probably 23. Okay. So you're just angry, angry, man. Angry, yeah. And so then, so you compound like a lack, you know, apathy and a lack of self love, a lack of faith in anything. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then a hard drug. So I got exposed to meth. Oh, man. Oh, wow. Next thing you know, Oof. I was in a hole. I was 135 pound. Whoa. Meth addict a year and a half later. Wow. Damn, dude. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so anyways, I I, I wanted to kick it um, and uh, for a variety of different reasons. And I found fitness was like, uh, I, I'm going to do the fitness thing. And then I saw people in the gym and they were doing the same thing they were doing 10 years ago, not getting better, they're getting worse. And I was like, well, shit, I don't want to walk down that path. Maybe it'll improve me for now, but I want something I can, I can bet on growing in forever. How know? did you go from, from meth addict to, <laughs> to, to, to I'm going to work out and take care of myself? Was there a moment where you're like, I need to get myself healthy? There were a couple moments actually. So, uh, one of my, one of my boys, we would run streets together. Right. And so we were, we were really good friends from being from little kid status. Right. And mm -hmm. I mean, he lived with me, grew up next door, grandparents knew each other. And, uh, and he was the one who was trying to tough me up. I was always a too nice kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, like I had no, no angry bone in my body. No he's grit. like, yeah, he's like, you need to toughen up. So we would like literally fight, 
just because he'd be like, ah, oh, you're too nice, and he just fucking punch me. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, we're banging each other's head into metal metal corners of the furniture or wooden furniture, and and fucking punching each other in the nuts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> shit, guys. This will toughen it. you up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, so so you know, fast forward, we're in our twenties, and we're both in the game, and. One day I, I go do drop off something for him and and then I'm like all right I'm out but I'm just the shell of who I am and I you know I'm tired you have no when you're that t- fatigued you, you guys know you work hard sometimes you're so tired you have no emotional yeah you know bandwidth whatsoever mm-hmm. so I'm like here you go give me my money see you later and uh, he just grabs me by my shoulders looks at me and it's like tears are streaming down his his face and he's like where the fuck is my friend who the fuck are you you know what I mean and oh, I was wow. just like and I was just like numb i look at him just like oh oh see ya (laughs) you know and i was like get in my car and it took me maybe a couple hours i go home and i'm thinking like man you know i should have really felt something felt something because i'm i'm actually very empathic you know i'm super emotively driven in life and and i didn't feel shit so it made me really kind of it was like a instead of mind pump it was like a mind fuck (laughs) you know it's our other podcast yeah there you go (laughs) we mind fuck you there you go yeah (laughs) man you know I'll fuck your Some mind like and I'll fuck your body. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Damn it. Write that down, uh, dog. Right. That's good. That's a good <laughs> tag. That's a good tag. Um, and so, yeah, man. So there was that. And then I happened to meet uh, who someone who will become my future wife. Oh, right? cool. And so I was like, oh, shit. She doesn't know I'm this fucked up. I, I can't let her know. I got to fix myself <laughs> while I'm trying to spit game. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then uh, the third part was, uh, you know, when you're – when you when you care about people but you know you're fucked up you avoid them you know and so so i just i went to my mom's house sat her down and was like hey mom you know i've been not around for about a year you know i'm fucked up you haven't really called me out on it just want to tell you thank you because that didn't polarize my mindset you know like mm-hmm. it doesn't gal- doesn't galvanize me you know, i think people in that state people come at them the wrong way you know they're yeah. like oh you got you're fucked up you need to fix yourself i'm like well fuck you i'm going to do more shit yeah. you know uh, so anyways i told her hey i really appreciate that you got six brothers, you've seen them all fuck up before, and and you just never really made me feel bad about it, even when I was around and kind of shamed about it. Mm. But don't worry, you know you see me you see me go down dark a couple times in life already. I just want to let you know I'm gonna fix it. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna fix it. So don't worry, mom, it's good. And it just took about a year to really get out of the hole. But fitness was this kind of recurring theme. Wow, man. Dude, what about the... That's tremendous yeah, What character. about the crazy. transition from like the withdrawals and stuff like that? Because if you got if you went down the meth way, dude, I mean, oh, you, yeah, I'm that had to been a motherfucker tough. to come off of. It was, man. And to be honest, you know, because I was still in the game, the the it was funny money. It didn't really exist. So I could always drop, you know, some some bread on some more shit. And, and I would. And it would if you had it, and you kind of do it. And especially you get triggered, you know? So, so you know, I'm, I'm talking to... I'm talking to this girl and, you know, when things didn't work out, she was young, she was fickle. I'd be, ah, fuck it. And then I'd go, I'd go smoke, you know what I mean? Or, mm-hmm. or just other things would trigger me, but, but it would gradually reduce, you know, it's kind of like, you know, training with an injury. It takes time for it to, right. you, 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 you'll forget that it was there eventually, but it takes maybe a year, you know, when you have a, a significant injury mm-hmm. to, even as you're getting better, you have these little backslides. You're like, oh, I, I stepped off, you know, I tried to accelerate too fast and it, it got fucked up again or a little bit, you know, right. but mm-hmm. hopefully not as bad as the original injury. So this is kind of this diminishing power that it had over me, but it took, you know, phases, iterations of, of, of going through it. So it's like you quit, but you didn't really quit. And then you quit and you didn't right. really quit. And you, uh, and then one day I was like, I, it was at a party and, and I didn't, I smoked it. That was the, the other thing. Smoking it to me is like a whole different level than, than snorting snorting stuff it's so, so much faster right yeah it just it just it was like uh, then you 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 uh it's kind of like this whole vaping thing you see how people are like oh they vape and then the the, the little electronic vapors and yeah then, and then they want to show off how big of a smoke they can blow yeah uh, you know cloud you know like, i'm a dragon you know yeah, like yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of the game it was so you almost made it this competitive thing and it was like it really wasn't about the competition you're just trying to get fucked up but you're trying to make it seem this external this external uh, community engagement with other fucking tweakers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, have you gone back and kind of unpacked all that to kind of figure out what kind of drove you down that path and and what what maybe you were hiding from or what you were trying to be numb to? Did you have you ever gone and done work on that before? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think uh, you know just just that reality of that those three experiences with death it just shook me to my core i just didn't i didn't think that uh it it, it basically 
altered my perspective on what 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 good meant or you know like if mm-hmm. you're if you're a good person you're gonna not suffer in that in certain ways you know all those yeah. people were good people to me the way that they left was as big of an impact on me as is the fact they were gone so, right so like my grand- grandmother just had her second open heart surgery she wasn't recovering well and so they rushed her to the hospital then they did an emergency third open heart surgery but then she then she died so i'm like why why even make her suffer that way she could have just right. went out mm. and she was like one of the sweetest people i ever knew you know so instead of being at the hospital i, I went <clears throat> when we we're at the hospital i drove to her house and i just laid in her bed you know mm. i just wanted to be mm. <clears throat> while that energy was still there you know and so uh so yeah that i mean it was that and then the the different iterations of it and just it just uh definitely just shook me to my core and i think to be honest i i look back and as we get older man we we build these walls and we and we start toughening ourselves but you know toughening ourselves is in a lack of sensitivity a lack of actual it turns into a lack of awareness of right. self mm. and i'm like fuck you know even now i'm, I'm thinking like man i'm trying to I'm trying to tear down these walls and I'm like, fuck, these things are big. They're, they're tall and thick. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. shit, you know, this is, this is a lot more work than it has been. So whether it was at that phase or even, even now, you know, making a move out to, to Austin and, and just like being away from my, my pillars of support, my family and other things, I just realized, man, you know, it's still happening and it happens behind the scenes and maybe it doesn't drive me to do the things I was doing before you dive into your work sometimes, or you dive into other things that, you know, you, you hold value to as well, but you, sometimes you don't realize some things that you're sacrificing. Um, it's just, it's just an interesting, interesting thing about humanity. I think I've, I'm finding more and more about myself, but, uh, going through like mastermind programs or stuff that's like personal development, self, self-development stuff. Uh, I realize like, Hey, when every time I do that, I uncover these, these truths about myself, I start remembering things about I'm realizing about other people at the same time. And also realizing that these are the limiting factors in my business and my relationships and, mm-hmm. and everything else that, that I actually aspire to accomplish. So, so yeah, I don't know exactly, exactly what I was trying to hide from other than just the, the pain yeah. of, of acknowledging that, you know, <clears throat> childhood beliefs, the adolescent beliefs of, of the world, or, you know, not even adolescent, the, the more pure the more innocent beliefs you have when you're young mm-hmm. are no longer there, you know? And, right. and so mm-hmm. like, that's a painful transition, I think. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you always been your, your, I mean, your character is coming through and it's, it's quite powerful. I'm sure people listening right now can hear it. Yeah. Um, and you're, have you always been this growth minded and, and self-aware of this kind of character or was it, is it just because it's been developed through these battles? Nah, man, you know, I, I'd be completely uh, dishonest if I didn't say that I was just, born kind of an older soul you know so i was like a little kid and i remember uh partying with my dad and you know they're 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 young so in the 70s and the early 80s you know everybody had kids and they're 20 years old yeah you know so i i didn't have my child until 35 and i thought man what the fuck you know i, I thought i was way behind schedule i was gonna have a kid have a house when i was 25 you know you, you how many of you guys had that whole I thing know, my mom had me at 20 dude my yeah. mom had me at 20 and my dad committed suicide by the time i was seven so i can totally relate to the stories right now man man you know I'm sorry to hear that, brother. But I, you know, I think it's important. A lot of people have a lot of judgment, or they don't understand. They don't understand also the impact it has on everybody else. You know what I mean? So, right. mm. um, in the family, in the in the whole community, the, it just creates this big void. But uh, and it's up to us to figure out what we need to do to to heal from that. Right? I think that's why I have a lot of compassion mm-hmm. when I meet almost anybody because you just don't fucking know. Yeah, you know I'm saying like yeah. you meet some guy and you're like, oh, he's a fucking asshole. Fuck that guy. And it's like, well. Do you know what that dude could potentially have been through for the last 20 years of his life? And the fact that he's still breathing and going and stuff like that's a victory. So I, I think that having a, a childhood or a background like that just gives you a lot of compassion probably for a lot of people. How, now. how yeah. diff, was it difficult for you to, cause you're talking about it now and you're talking very openly and I really appreciate that. Has it, has it always been this easy for you to talk about these things or was this a process? Is this part of the process? I tend to uh, prefer being really transparent, man. You know, I, I, I have one version of me, you know, a lot of people, they wear a lot of different masks. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a painful process to try to be something, anything less than purely authentic. And so if I'm going to have a conversation with people, I hope to build a relationship with, even if we have this audience that, you know, I don't know, I haven't connected with, you know, all I know is I'm sitting in front of these three guys that I really respect. I really want to be able to say like, Hey man, you know, let's, let's figure out how we can do things together and really blow shit up. 
like I can't I can't afford to miss my opportunity to be completely transparent, tr- completely authentic because so true. Mm-hmm. because then you have to figure out which version of me is the one you're talking to. Right, right. And 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 to me, I I just don't know. I don't even know how to do it. You know, even growing up. Uh, a lot of my boys would give me a hard time. They call me like Sensitivo or something like that. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm like, motherfucker, you're the one upper. I'm the Sensitivo. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you remember. There's this commercial where they had like the different types of dudes, and there's always the one upper. Yeah. So yeah. like, oh, you, know, yeah. you came in with the new car, and he put out his Lambo key or yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Oh my god. And then it, there is the joke is like, oh, this guy, he's oh, Sensitivo. He's over here writing poetry at the bar. <laughs> <for his brother." laughs> yes. But the thing was, they give me a hard time because it's like, oh man, you know check out that girl she's she's feeling you i go talk to her i'm like yeah nope not into it you know and it's like they're like no you just just close it's like finding a rhythm you know what i mean i'm like nah to me it's not really like that you know anything that feels inauthentic doesn't feel uh feel right it doesn't feel right Right. you know Mm -hmm. is it's just not worth it so you're terrible at lying i'm horrible at lying so (laughs) if i if i try to be here and you you hear a lot of ums or you know me trying to fabricate things on the fly is just it don't work. It's just not it don't work. work. So yeah, I, so you, I totally identify with that. I'm you, the same way. You go through all kinds of stuff in your early 20s. You you start to get yourself cleaned up. You find fitness. You start working out. Where do you where do you finally move your way into the gym industry and get a gym before you even meet on it? Oh shit, man! I, to be honest, there's a couple. There's a phase that kind of bridges that gap. So, oh yeah. So um, I was uh, I was like, okay, I'm gonna get this certification, and and then it was. There's a practical in Santa Cruz. I worked with the you know well known retired bodybuilder, and I'm like, man, this dude's in pain. You know what I mean? So mm. not to say that you can't do bodybuilding in a way. Now there's so many different perspectives you can integrate into that and have a a, a more like functionally aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. I think Adam's done a great job of that. You know, I've seen him do uh, some 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 wild movement shit, mm-hmm. and, and he's a big swole dude. You know, and the thing about it is, is like, well. You know, a lot of that wasn't part of the perspective before. Right. But uh, so I just didn't realize that at that time, even because everything was so dogmatic and everything was so compartmentalized, Mm -hmm. even at that point in the early 2000s. So I got that and I was like, okay, cool. But this is the same shit I was doing curls for the girls in in my garage when I was in high school. And so I started looking for more, looking for more stuff. But the internet wasn't really blowing up yet. Right. But uh, Muscle Media 2000 was a publication and they started that. writing, uh, <laughs> Pavel Satsalin started writing articles mm-hmm. and I'm like, what the, who the fuck is this dude? Uh, his, he was really witty, funny, kind of dry sense of humor, but the information was something I never saw before in terms of the way he delivered. It was highly practical and very like had a scientific background, but the, it was distilled into mm-hmm. terms that anybody can understand and apply. And I was like, man, he that's wasn't trying shit. to talk over you. Right? No, nah. yeah. Yeah, it, was, it was distilled into this most simple form. And, and mm-hmm. if you did it, you're like, oh shit, this this shit works, and so I, I started buying every piece of content that he put out, mm-hmm. started applying it, and I got went from like that 135 pound meth addict to 175 pound shredded, yeah. and really fucking strong, you know, dude, and uh, and so it was great. So I wanted to go deeper, deeper, deeper. Uh, I found a, a testimonial he wrote for this dude Scott Sonnen. He 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 was moving crazy. I never seen anything like it, and I had a martial arts background, so I was like really kind of like, oh, I want to move like that. That's fucking weird, you know? Mm-hmm. So I started getting his content. It was horribly, re- horrible recordings, VHS. You can, <laughs> it's like more snow than anything else. You're like, oh, shh, <laughs> You know, production <laughs> left a lot to be desired back then. And so you know this, you're an OG trainer if you're getting some of your information on VHS. VHS. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I'm telling my age here a little bit, right? You know, <laughs> people are like, what the fuck's a VHS? Listen, <laughs> off, uh, listen <laughs> motherfucker. I've been in this game for a minute. I've been watching VHS fitness shit. Come on. Man, I a whole bookshelf of VHS. You know? <laughs> um, but then I, I saw in 2002, I spent a whole year just doing nothing but swinging uh, kettlebells and clubs. Like Wow, back in 02, you said? 02. Wow. Because yeah, yeah, nobody, early. not in, head of the game. Yeah, bro, nobody was using clubs, especially back then. Maybe yeah. yes, some kettlebells, but that was pretty rare. Clubs, nobody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, I was just this weirdo. And I, anybody who would let me torture them, they went in the garage with me and they're like, you know, obviously they couldn't walk for a week. You know, back then it, it was a lot less refined the delivery it was just like <laughs> I, I bought my kettlebells and I couldn't walk for a week after my first session so I just wanted to share that with everybody right, you know right, right. hamstrings are so blown out <laughs> and uh and so that was a process 2003 I went through both of those those guys certifications and and I think that's been the foundation of my perspective my martial arts instructor when I was young he, he had an integrative approach boxing jiu-jitsu uh, boxing judo jiu-jitsu and karate which is kind of like blasphemy blasphemy back then in terms right. of integrating content 
all martial arts have done that over like from history but but then when you're new and you do it you're like oh no you're not supposed to do that it doesn't right. mm-hmm. honor the tradition mm-hmm. and so uh so i realized back then i just want to do what works it doesn't really matter what you call it or but if someone's trying to throw me i'm gonna fucking punch them upside the head you know or in the <laughs> neck i don't care you know if someone's trying to to grapple me i'm gonna shove my fist in their face or right. one back and forth and so uh it was really about practicality and and effective application so when these two schools of thought they didn't really jive really rigid hard style really fluid movement and swinging clubs it was like mm-hmm. more like dancing almost you know like and so for me i was like no it makes perfect sense that these are two opposite sides of the same coin Mm -hmm. and everybody else you know they try to integrate those things and they weren't very successful that's kind of the the foundation of what evolved into to put me in a great position was i made those two things work really well together and then i started finding other modules i thought filled in the gaps Um, and and uh once i became a professional brought in a lot of education and to do that so in 2003 got those things certified didn't start training people professionally until 2007 but it was training people for free. So you're still working, you're working a hotel business at this time? Or? I was working hotels. I was still doing the street thing. I was working uh, behavior sciences with autistic kids. I was working in mortgage. I was Damn, working, dude. What? Yeah. Wow. You know, yeah Hustle, doing, hustling. Yeah, you know, hustling. Whatever, whatever game there was that I thought, you know, I could take some skills away from, um, that, that's, that's what I was, I was trying to do. So I thought real estate was important. I was trying to get insurance. They wouldn't give me a, a state license, right? And, they, and tried to work in real estate as a, as a real estate agent. They wouldn't give me a license. So I just worked in the industry. I managed a team, a processing team. I managed a team of, uh, of, of loan originators. And so I was, still, I was still in a position of authority and control, but I wasn't able to like hold a broker's license or anything right, like right. that. Yeah. So you're doing that. Then when do you actually get your first gym? So 2007, I start training people at Gold's Gym, right, in Salinas. Uh, I was this crazy, they called me either Tarzan or fucking uh, caveman because I'm swinging clubs. I'm doing these crazy. That nobody pull-ups. else is probably doing at that time. Yeah, yeah the girls are on the treadmill and, and they're facing me and they're like giggling and pointing and you know what I mean? And the guys are like, they're flexing and they yeah. try to like, come here. Do you mind if I try that? I'm like, go ahead and try it. You're like. They're like, what the fuck, bro? That's heavy. That's hard. You know, like, <laughs> like, hey, man, you know, but, you know, and I can't do exactly what they do, but maybe I can do most of everything they can do, you right, know, or, right. or, and some shit, a lot of shit nobody else could do. So, so then I started to have this weird reputation and uh, met this other trainer. He's like, oh, you're, it's Salinas. You're crazy Vato, man. Hey, you, you like this other crazy fucker, you know? <laughs> yeah. He's here at night. You need to come back at night and catch up. What's his name? Jim, Jim Romick. I was like, okay, cool. So we, I catch up with the other crazy fucking trainer in the gym. And then we start, you know, architecting some type of future where we could collaborate and share, share visions and do stuff like that. Um, and still, I was just kind of casual at that. Started doing it more and more and more. Uh, built out my little detached garage in my backyard start training people in there um then transition to i was like man i'm only i'm only touching like the people who have money you know even back then it was like 50 60 dollars a session now that's nothing you know compared to what, I, what we're charging out in austin but at the same time in salinas the economics sucked right. yeah, different. especially at that time too especially yeah, at the time oh. so like my dream wasn't to like serve the upper 20 percent. it was to like change lives you know so uh, 2008, some of my clients, I was like, man, I'm thinking about doing this boot camp in, in the park thing. And, and they're like, well, I know people on city council. So if it doesn't go through, then, then I'll get them to back you. And so we started using the parks, doing boot camps in the parks to October, 2008. Um, uh, this, then I was like, man, this kind of sucks lugging 2000 pounds of kettlebells and <laughs> equipment to the park five times a day. I bought a truck just to do that. And then I started, I, I found out I'd start looking at commercial real estate and I was like, Oh, just dreaming. You know, like, Oh, this would be a good gym. This would be a good gym. I, I had this lady show me this, this property. And I was like, this would be the perfect spot. And I was like, Oh, you know, to be honest, I can't, I can't really afford it. She's like, what do you want to do here? I wanted to build a gym. She said, well, the other people looking at it want to build a gym too. I say, well, here's my card. Give it to them. Ask them to call me. And, and cause this is a big nut for any facility that's just opening. Maybe we can collaborate. I get the call. From a, a guy, Frank Knapp, awesome, awesome dude. Uh, he's he. I happened to do a little free workshop for the black belts of this martial arts studio. He and his wife, and their sensei, were, were all part of that. 
group. Oh, no shit. And Small like, world, huh? Yeah, they're like, John, oh, yeah, we know Perfect. you, man. You did this workshop for us. And I was like, man, hey, you know what? Let's meet up for dinner. I want to see if we can do something together in this space. And it, yeah, it just it just really worked out. So we worked together for 18 months. Um, so you ended up getting this gym together or creating it together? Creating it together, yeah. We, we figured out how to share the schedule, share the space. Our communities were different, but we're aligned in, in energy, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was always like... There's always still like two different communities, but at the same time, you know, we knew that we're we're thriving as a result of our, our willingness to collaborate and, and share resources. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they, their training influenced the future perspectives we had. Our training influenced the future perspectives they had. Um, you know, we brought in a bunch of equipment. They wanted to learn how to use it, vice versa. So it was it really worked out. And it's you know, it's a it's a growing up process to, you know, not have an, a big ego and and learn to like collaborate on that level too right especially in limited resources space you right. know in time and so uh 18 months we did that and then i was like you know uh, i think we're outgrowing this i think you guys are well established and you're probably outgrowing this relationship in this space and uh, as comfortable as it is it's not allowing us to take the next step so i grabbed a five thousand square foot space down the street about a mile and a half and and then that was the the gym the gym opening. Oh shit! Wow, and now, how long are you? How long are you running that before you make your way over to Austin? So uh, December first, two thousand ten, my dad's birthday. We opened grand opening, and then uh, two thousand fourteen, August of two thousand fourteen, is when I moved to Austin. Okay. Now, when you moved to Austin, did Aubrey or somebody connected on it find you or know of you? Yeah, and is that why you moved you? over there, or did you go over there with? No idea. So yeah, I was the top of a short list is what I said earlier, right? So Yeah, how'd happened, you get on this list? Yeah, so what happened was my predecessor, uh, this guy, Mark DeGrasse, he had a publication called My Mad Methods Magazine. It was an unconventional training magazine based in Orange County. Hmm. Eventually, uh, so he and I, we, we caught up because he wanted some content and he got a referral to me, uh, to me and my team. So he came up one day and he shot a bunch of content just for, you know, YouTube and, and stuff. And, and I asked him like, well, he was shooting with my business partner, Jim, the other crazy fucking trainer that mm-hmm. was at, at uh, Gold. So Jim was doing some club work for MMA athletes. And so that was the theme of their article and the content they shot. And and then I was like, well, shit, you're here. You just drove up from Orange County. You know, like, do you want some more content? You know, as a content producer, he's like, fuck, yeah, I want more content. I was like, well, he, Jim's doing some club shit. Uh, I'll do some kettlebell stuff because, you know, again, those are the two things that were the foundation of the frame of mind that we had other than like body weight stuff, but you know, tool specific stuff to tend to jive. And he's like, well, yeah, kettlebells will usually, usually do something in that market right then. I was like, well, what do you, what does your audience want? He's like, well, there's two ways to go about it. Do something really fucking heavy, (laughs) right? Or do something people have never seen before. And Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I'm strong, but there's always going to be someone who can match that weight. Right. You know? And so then I was like, I'm going to do shit. No one's ever seen before. So I had, Jim call out like really like like call out an unconventional body weight movement and then I'll turn it into like on the fly I'll turn it into a flow sequence integrating that movement with a kettlebell movement and so basically it was almost like on a dare like do this and, you know I was like uh and then I, I I did this crazy shit right and so it was fun because it was pure, purely organic and uh just allowed for an expression of like 10 years of investment in mastery of these these skills in in a, in a format that I didn't even challenge myself to do before. Oh wow. But that video kind of blew up and then we collaborated on on a a, a DVD called Evolution Kettlebell Groundwork basically just how you can how you can develop the attributes to actually do that without fucking yourself up because people were trying to like trying emulate to what I was doing. Right, right. <laughs> like no, don't do that. Yeah. I was just showing off and You're having fun. Ready. It's yeah. not something I want people to indiscriminately try to do. Um, anyway, yeah. And so, so, but market always realizes like, Hey, you know, we had an integrative, integrative approach to our our training methodology at our studio. Most people would be a kettlebell person or they would swing clubs or they were doing yoga or they were, you know, if when animal flow came out, they like prefer to do animal flow or whatever the case is. But it was really like at the most, they had one or two, two trick ponies, you know, in the right. way that, that they, that the two things they subscribe to most. And we we're like, fuck that. We use everything, everything. and mm-hmm. we put it all together in a cohesive system <laughs> so that they're not competitive, but complementary. Right. That's and so great. when, uh, when they wanted to do education, Mark's like, no, I'm a content producer. I'm an info marketer. I don't do education, I, but I know, I know 
who you guys would want. And they flew me out. I sat in a room for two days on architecting this whole education system on the whiteboard. And, uh, this is that on it. That on it. Yeah. Okay. And then I interviewed with Aubrey and you know, he, he like looked right into my soul. And (laughs) so at the end of the interview, he's like, okay, so Wolf. Yeah. Um, so you're basically a care bear that wants to fuck everybody. Because <laughs> <Like, laughs> I tell a lot of dirty jokes. And, but, I'm, but I'm literally, the first Whoa. day I'm there, I'm hugging everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, that's just who I am. My family, you know, we just like really love you. Huggers. Hug, yeah, huggers, man. Yeah. Hug everybody. Yeah. Don't, it don't matter. You can be sweaty, nasty, funky. You're still getting a hug. Yeah. Yeah. At, at the studio, on the way out, that was how you cashed out. You know, like, you know, you work out, you have a cash out sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Like, all right, the cash out is like, positive human contact you have to if you don't want to hug you have to give me a high five this right. is it's yeah. okay you don't have to do the hug thing if you're not a hugger yeah but um but you know you can't leave without some type of affirmation you know some type of physical affirmation that's cool a good job but uh yeah so so after that that was in april i went back to selena started architecting like re- refining the deliver the 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 curriculum and that was our back then it was called level one it's now called our foundations courses it's basically like a smorgasbord of all the different methodologies and a, a framework of how to understand how they plug and play together and play nice together versus, you know, just, Oh, just mace or just club or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it's a really cool thing. Cause then people is like almost like going to a big Las Vegas buffet. If you never had, you know, they all have the, the different tables Like they have the Japanese food table. They have the it- Italian food table. They have, yeah. you know, the dessert table. That's my favorite. Um, <laughs> yeah. But if you never had some of those foods and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people, if you don't grow up around here, here we we've had it all, right? And, and we are culturally diverse play, as culturally diverse places you can be. San Jose, Monterey, right? Melting like, pot, oh, yeah. right here. Yeah, I, I can tell the difference between a Vietnamese, a Korean, a Japanese, a right. Chinese. Most people can't. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. you, you just blump, you know, lump them up into one. Right. You know, right, right. and you're wrong all the time. Right. They're, they're, they're wrong all <laughs> yeah. the time. I can say I can say thank you and hello in almost all those languages, and I can order food in almost all those languages, right? That's and, great. And, and almost every other one too, but um, but uh, yeah, so. So that integrative approach, I kind of t- totally lost track of what I was. Well, what's cool, what's cool about where you're at right now, which is, you know, all of us had found on it. I don't know how many years ago. And Justin was, I think, the first one to find it and turn all of us on. And what mm-hmm. it's now hearing the story, it's really cool because what turned us on about on it, besides the cool branding, because I do like the branding is this piece was yeah. you was what you brought to on it because we had all been doing this for 15 20 years and one of the, our biggest pet peeves with the industry is all the tribalism yeah is all the tribalism uh, and the separating so many great tools and great modalities that should be intertwined for well, the, for uh, for a human optimization for the average person who just wants to be a better human like you should be using all these fucking tools but nobody was really presenting that information it was i'm an indian club guy i'm a mace guy i'm a bodybuilder yeah. guy i'm a runner Got, you know what I'm saying? It's like never made any sense to me. It yeah. never made any sense to me because even though I may not personally be doing all these different modalities myself, I could see the value and the benefit and I could respect and appreciate them. And as a trainer, it was like, wow, I could really see how something from this can benefit this particular client over there. And if I'm being an honest trainer, I'm going to try and do the best thing for the client. And sometimes that means that you look at your tool belt and you got to add a new tool. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? If I have a screwdriver and a hammer, Sometimes I may need something else that's going to do the job. I mean, he saw or something like that. And, you know, looking at all these different modalities, they exist for a reason. Yeah. Anna did that very well. And that's what really, you know, drew us to that. And well, shit, like you it, was did that. it was you who did that really well. Let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, that's I, knowing that story now, I didn't know that's how I didn't know if on it had all these ideas then they found just right. some badass trainer and they integrated you it. but you really yeah. integrated all the systems into on it well the systems yes but up to be honest the vision was already there right so that's Onnit where they already, wanted to go yeah they wanted to go because they already had well aubrey's a philosopher and history buff so you know the reason that they had clubs and maces is because the historical context of it mm-hmm. but the reality was is like uh the evolution of the education is is the result of me, the refinement of that stuff. But, you know, he was looking at it more from the, like the Paolani, you know, mindset is like, okay, it was more like, like you see a lot of people are traditionalists with maces. They still just do 10 to twos and three sixties mm-hmm. or with Indian clubs they're they're just doing like, you know, um, basic you know, shoulder very, rotation like, stuff. Yeah, like exactly. Swings, yeah. And it doesn't make it wrong. It right. just means like for, for me, what I wanted to do is look at how to integrate that into a framework that respected modern understanding of biomechanics mm. and 
and and had a focus not on purely the historical applications. With not everybody's a fucking wrestler. Not everybody, right, right. you know. So not everybody wants to do kettlebell Have sport. You pissed off the purists because I know that like for I'm me, a fucking heretic, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I piss off everybody, yeah. right? Because <laughs> I mean, you guys are. I think we yeah. were late here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, even with martial arts, obviously you see that too, where like people they, they want you to stay in that one uh, uh, school and, and master that, and then you know integrating these other uh, different schools is like blasphemy and I felt yeah. the same way with kettlebells because you know I have very similar background to you as far as like being the guy in Gold's gym with Olympic rings and with kettlebells and everybody's like what the fuck are you doing and it, it was just this for me I've always been very curious as to what else is out there you know what are these other people doing but me you know vesting in getting certified and then taking away what I felt was like the most impactful most beneficial that would blend well and play nice uh, you know with these other uh, you know dumbbells barbells everything else how do we incorporate all of it so I definitely took notice of on it uh, for that reason you, you mentioned so, you mentioned the history of some of these uh, dev- I, I find that absolutely fascinating I'm not super versed I know a little bit about the history of some of these training modalities because I think a lot of people see clubs and kettlebells and like oh it's the newest thing and it's like actually <laughs> it's the oldest it's the thing. oldest thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> actually that's before dumbbells and barbells like yeah. do you know the history of some of these tools I'd love to go into kind of why wh- how they were used historically and you know wh- why we have them now yeah I mean I you know I, I probably wouldn't be the best in terms of historians on these things you know people like Dr. Ed Thomas mm. yes. he's he's someone you'd want to bring in here and talk about that but oh, I mean yeah. I could we could superficially kind of flirt with those ideas and and understand you know the the reality has been for me I'd like to I'd like to know <laughs> enough about that but then i think the a big thing is is uh it's another reason why i haven't like i i don't always know everybody who's in the know like mm-hmm. a lot of times because um i'm a, i'm a big introvert so like for me i don't seek validation externally to the processes that mm-hmm. i'm trying to work through it, it I, I do that after i internalize them on a deep way and then you know, if it makes sense inside then you know, I can I can put a lot Got of it. faith in it, but um, but yeah, we can talk about some of the history of this stuff. And, and hey, in the audience, if if I get some facts wrong, you know, <laughs> oh, don't, don't worry, they're don't, quick to let us know what we do. Well, let's start, let's, <laughs> let's start with clubs. Like, uh, I've been schooled. like where where did clubs I guess come from, and what are they? What were they used for traditionally, and what are they? What is unique about clubs, for example, that's beneficial from using them versus other pieces of equipment? Oh man, that's a that's a fun one, right? Yeah. So like, there there have been studies. Are that argue that the human hand evolved to do two things: throw, right. throw shit, mm-hmm. and so you need that highly artic- that very articulate, good, great articulation in the hand, so you can finesse things that you throw and, and be able to. And you see that in baseball. Look at the type of things they oh, do yeah. with the fucking ball, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. um, but Jake Arrieta trains at the gym lately, and you know, I'm like, oh, this is fucking so cool, uh, so cool. Dude. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's a big guy like you, Adam. So yeah. you know, I'm like, oh man. It's- Hello, sir. Hey, bro, it fascinates me what they do with the baseball, bro. How much we've evolved that sport, man. Oh, so yeah. crazy. Yeah, it is. And, and so that that's something. That, so and then and then to swing club like objects, which were historically, you know, some it didn't have to look like a club. It was a stick or a fucking whatever the stick, fuck. a sword, an extension so, of our yeah. arm. Yeah. Exactly, it's an extension of our lever systems, right? And to be able to articulate the hand and and make it a continuous part of extension of those levers and so uh so that's argument argumentatively like potentially that's the reason our hands evolved to be so different than our our, our other, other primates other primates right so so we can go back that far but then you have historically from a training methodology um the persians and indians had taken club swinging and they had different versions of clubs, whether meals or or other like stone clubs or clubs with spikes on them. Mm-hmm. And they're all just used in a more traditional sense, you know, like uh, more of these big rotations, more like a, you know, single arm, you know, uh, circular circular uh, rotations behind the back and then pulled over. And then they, they would do it even historically. They have like Paulani. House of Power, they 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 do it to music in a rhythmic fashion for a long, long, long sets, like almost like you know, rhythmic kettlebell sport. You know, oh, okay, <laughs> but, interesting. But but again, the the drill selection is relatively limited because the materials 
dictated that the tools were really big, mm-hmm. right? And so that alters the mechanics to a great degree. Even meals, like I saw Justin swinging some big meals, mm-hmm. but to get a decent weight, you have a lot of material and right. the diameter of that material changes the mechanics. Mm-hmm. Right. So, mm-hmm. so now with modern, um, modern materials, steel particularly, you can have a lot more consistency because even if you use high quality wood, the density of wood is going to be variable at different points. Mm-hmm. So every tool is very unique, which makes it really cool. Like, oh, these are my favorite. The, 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 this is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you know I mean? right, right. right? With, with the club, you know, it's a, it's a standard standardized manufacturing process. So mm-hmm. with the steel clubs. And so now greater consistency, the mechanics can be refined to a greater degree and the drill selection can be opened up because of the relatively narrow profile of the tool. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to do a lot more with the tool um, with these modernized clubs. And again, you have to give credit to to Scott for that. Interesting. Um, So the clubs- the first one to do that. He's part of TACFIT, right? Yeah, TACFIT. I used to, so I used to- be the director, U.S. director of education for their systems, so okay. both circular strength training oh, okay. and, and tack fit. So clubs really good for that articulation of the hands and wrists and rotational strength. Rotational, rotational strength. Okay, yeah. rotational yeah. strength. Yeah, and and so you know that's that's the rotational strength is actually a recurring theme. Of all the tools I'm about to mm-hmm. you, we talked about being a you know heretic and blasphemer. Yeah, uh, we're coming out with the unconventional barbell course at the end of March. Um, so it's it's like Easter weekend, but if any of you guys want to come, dude, you guys come. So you're gonna do a bunch of weird stuff with barbells. Oh, it's, wow. it's 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 more. You, I do a bunch of weird stuff with barbells, no doubt. But it's less about imparting, doing weird stuff with barbells, and more about an understanding of how to challenge the, the thought process of why you only use barbells the way that you use them, mm. and then empowering people with. It's for all of our education, not about a library of drills is about a thought process, mm-hmm. right? And, and about the ability to validate why you're doing what the fuck you're doing. Because, oh, wow. because we don't want a bunch of drones saying, well, John Wolf said this. They're like, no, no, John Wolf never said that. John Wolf asks questions. John Wolf says, well, what is the fucking outcome you want? Who mm-hmm. are you training? What's their history? Right. You know, and then, then we can come up with a unique, you know, game plan. Mm-hmm. But, but, uh, so rather than teaching people what to think, you're teaching them how to think. Yeah, that's what, comes to this. Uh, hopefully that's what I'm hoping we're mm-hmm. doing and giving them tools to to connect to their clientele in a more deep and, a, you know, like a, a little more, man, it's about trust and communication. Mm-hmm. Like psychology trumps physiology. You can have a perfect program, but if, if, if you're coaching somebody, the interaction you have and the trust they have in you, it Damn. drives response. You know what I love away. about talking with mm-hmm. uh, trainers who've been trainers for a long time who are really good trainers? Yeah, they get that. Yep, because- you know, if you if if you've got a bunch of people trying to come up with an answer to a problem, and you've got a lot of people working really hard, they're really smart, and they've got lots of integrity. At some point, they're all going to come to the same answer because there's one answer, you know, or at least a set of answers to the particular problem. So a, it's cra- I've never met you, but a lot of what you're saying, we, you're echoing a lot of what we said, yep. yeah. and it's like it's just because it's the truth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it it, it, it uh, multiple sources of validation of. of of truth, of the truth, yeah, right? right? And so, so it's a lot of times now people are like, oh, no, nah, fuck that. I was the first one to do that. Motherfucker, you weren't the first one to do <laughs> shit. <Yeah. right? laughs> uh, you might be the first one to express it in your words, in your, you know, your unique experience that got you there is very valid and very valuable. But fuck, human beings have been moving the same ways for millennia. Yeah. Somebody long before any of us, dancers have fucked up and done better movement than a lot of us. Um, You know, people have been expressing themselves through cultural dance and movement and and training in a variety of different ways. Since before we could record it. Exactly. We're leaning on shoulders of giants and and uh, I think we all just forget that and like it becomes this ego thing. Like, Well, I came up with this system and you're, you know, you're copying my system and this and that and that's like all I see. It's so ridiculous. I I remember going, I went to the Louvre Museum which is in in Paris. It's a wonderful museum. It's one of the best museums I've ever been to. And there was an ancient, there was a section with ancient like Greek and Roman art. And I'm, and at the time I was training in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I, I had learned this particular position that I had learned, right? So, and it just wasn't, it wasn't in my mind. I was just walking through this, this art section and there was a tablet that was about that size. So, you know, about the size of like a normal size poster and on the tablet carved into the tablet was, were these wrestlers. So this thing is like, I don't know. 2,500 years old, 3,000 years old. And they were doing, a, it was a move that I had learned 
like last week that I thought was this new cool, like, oh yeah. shit, this is a new cool. I'm like, that's fucking, this move's old. <laughs> it's just been around forever, man. It still works, yep. though. And it's, yeah, that's it right. It still works. The stuff right. that works sticks. Yeah, that's yeah, right. right? Yeah. What about what about kettlebells? Like, uh, what's the history of those and what are those good for that's different than like using other tools like, like clubs? You know, so historically, I, I, that's another one has been around forever, but where they'd use it to measure the weight of dry goods are historically right so they weren't they weren't ergonomically sound you know yeah, they're just someone yeah. someone was like oh this is cool it's a weight and i want to get stronger i'm going to use this weight that we use to measure grain right and so then all of a sudden you know it evolved somehow. so it was a measuring tool first yeah it was a measuring oh, tool that. first like mm-hmm. you know you're at the the farm or at the market and it's like okay well it's a pood a pood sounds sounds funny, right? You yeah. know, it's roughly sixteen That's kilos. Like the past tense hey, of poo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I pooed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'm pooing. I might poo. I pooed. I pooed. Yeah. So you go to you go to go buy your your you know sixty pounds of beef, and they 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 counterbalance it with the the kettlebell. Yeah, exactly right. So that's. From from what it, my understanding, that's the original context of it. And then the guy who's probably weighing every day starts to notice he's starting to get more he's jacked like, in, jacked in his shoulders. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe I should start doing this the my other hand. And huge. Then, <laughs> there you go. Swole. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly right. And so then you know, you know, then then it became this sport in Russia, right? I I don't know the evolution from there to mm-hmm. there, but but then there's our understanding of modern kettlebells who came from Pavel's you know, transporting of kettlebells over here and, and him doing kind of what, what I like to think I'm trying to do is like, well, applying modern, modern science to mm-hmm. our, our current understanding of movement <laughs> and training into a tool that has a time, you know, time honored tradition. And, and so then in doing so, he, he polarized the kettlebell thought process, right? You had the, the, mm-hmm the sport and you had the hard style the RKC. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so that's been really cool, but I love kettlebells because of the versatility, the portability, man, you know, like it, it still bridges the gap of traditional strength training and then ballistics and offset load. So it's, but it's not offset to the degree that a, a mace or a club is. So there's the easier to teach maybe a little bit. Yeah. You know, in some ways it's harder. It's really weird. Um, if I want to teach a swing, I find a narrow stance, like a, you know, like if your, your stance is a hip width Mm -hmm. and you look at like skiing or like a vertical jump, you would naturally explode off, off of that platform, like your narrow stance. And so two relatively light clubs outside the legs swinging in that way is much more natural than a Mm -hmm. short lever because the timing, like the longer lever, it lets your body entrain to the timing much mm. more easily right. versus uh, the short lever and especially in that. Because your hips want to break too early all the time with a kettlebell. Exactly. Yeah, it's the same thing. Exactly. But with the clubs, you, it's really easy because you can even see them in your periphery as they move. Huh. You, you, with the kettlebell, it just it drops and then you, you want to, you know, people yeah, you just almost get, lose sight. Yeah. Pl- plus the damn thing's moving right towards your nuts if you're good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Valid point. Yeah. yeah well, I, I tell people like play chicken with your nuts. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Trust me, you'll move. You'll move. <laughs> It's yeah. kind of like, remember when you're young and the girls would get mad at you and they want to kick you in the nuts? Yeah. You know, you'd be talking to somebody, looking away, and all of a sudden your knees just close. Like, right, hey, right. There, yeah. There's like a, a force field. There is. There's like yeah, a yeah. sensory <laughs> organ. <laughs> we, we have a knees. seventh sense. Uh, Guys have a seventh danger, sense danger. right there of the, the penis, yeah. man. That's it's it's like, yeah. yeah, this is a, pre- a, pre- a protective reflex. Yeah. 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 Some of it's a little overprotective, like a, a flinch reflex if you've yeah. ever been a fighter. you know, If someone barely moves towards you and you flinch, you know, they, the hand wasn't even going. You're, you're going to get clocked, right? Yeah. So you have to set desensitize it yeah. so you have to get people to realize it you need to get the kettlebell closer to your nuts before you break your hips man you know that's yeah. funny just the last minute the last second. <laughs> that's, that's so awesome are there any uh any tools on the horizon and stuff that are relatively new that you're excited about you know it, it's taken a uh i don't know if this new new ish is there evolutions of of other tools that have come out you yeah. know so um, what about the Bulgarian bag? That's what I was yeah. about to bring up. Yeah. I was about to bring up. So the Bulgarian bag, it took me a while to really like appreciate it to the degree it is uh, mm-hmm. of, of, of how powerful it is. Um, maybe I'll let you guys in on, on a, I have this buddy who had been doing, you know, kettlebell sport and Bulgarian bag training on the beach in this town called Vieste in Italy. Fucking beautiful place. Right. So like the spur of the boot of Italy, mm-hmm. not the heel, but the spur It's this beautiful, like, forest it's a national forest and around it is like 
really great beaches and they have mm. the uh, Lido's. Wait, is that the toe of the boot? Is that Calabria or is it on the other no, side? No, no, on, on the, uh, above the, the heel? heel. Oh, okay. So near Puglia. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Puglia. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, uh, so we're over there and so he used to run these uh, boot camps on the beach and he was in great Bulgarian bag and kettlebell and a bunch of body weight stuff and he had this place he built on the beach. It was uh, I didn't get to see it only in pictures. But at the same time, he'd been doing Bulgarian bag education. But then, you know, hey, just like everything else, is someone's IP. So you can only do so much with it without causing mm-hmm. causing. Sure. They're very protective, and they're yeah. very protective. You know, and that, that's fine. You know, you bring something to the market, you want to protect it. Hey, that will limit the growth of that thing. Definitely, you've seen that with Scott Sonnen in the clubs. Mm-hmm. Why have clubs not taken off? Well, because you're kind of a dick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, not um, very open. Yeah, very. yeah. So you know, and same thing. You know, I don't know. Uh, Ivanov, so I, I I would never speak ill of him, but I know he's protective of his IP, and, and that's his right. Mm-hmm, so yeah. I don't have any judgment there. Um, but but it did result in my friend not being able to to grow the way he wanted to grow. Mm-hmm. So we've collaborated on a project where we're using a more dynamic resistance version of a something similar to a Bulgarian bag. Mm-hmm. It's not a Bulgarian bag. It's a Bulgarian bag is what it is. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. So it's a he it calls it the Hydrocore. And so it has uh, variable handles because one of the things with the Bulgarian bag is those nipples, they're really challenging. And if you're distracted because you, you can't hold on to something, it's really hard to learn. Mm-hmm. You see that with the clubs as well, right? It's so challenging in a very unique way. So once your hands give out, you start uh, using really weird mechanics. Yeah, you start compensating. Yeah. You start compensating really quickly and because you're afraid you're going to fucking lose it, you know? Yeah. Same thing with the Bulgarian bag. So, so we worked on various different types of, of grips that attached to uh, a, like a yoke shaped uh, um, device that is water filled. So mm-hmm. the nice thing is now you have one tool that you can add a cup of water, you know, v- v- you have that variability of resistance and it's dynamic because the water is, is a sl- it's like a slosh pipe and, a, and something that you can use. That's so for, rare. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's HydroCore. So he already has some like uh, social media assets that he's developed. Oh, it's already or, out. It's no, out? it's not out. He just he, oh, okay. he just shows off his prototypes. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know they're they're in the production manufacturing process. So it's a it's a it's a really cool it's a really cool tool. I think is is highly portable because you can just fold it up and put it in your in your oh, that's suitcase dope. and then oh, you that's fill it up with water. You fill it up with water. Yeah, you go to a pool and just dunk it in the pool. You know, that's dope. That's convenient. Um, yeah, that's awesome. that's a fucking dope project. That is so man. rad. Now, are you a part of that project or is it just a buddy of yours? It's a buddy of mine, and you know, he was you know he wanted to team up with with our education and our manufacturing and our mm. brand. So I was like, man, this is a really cool. He, he's 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 an idea guy. He's always coming up with crazy ideas. Uh, Maurizio Tangari, great human being fucking amazing a loving coach just loving father he's just a great dude you know and he, he's always john what about this idea i'm like well that's not something that we would have an appetite for mm. but you know i can plug you in with other people and this one i was like no this one right up our alley i yeah <laughs> um everybody can use it it travels well it's it's uh again one verse one of them you can start you know because you blow it up with air the rest of it so it still holds shape it's not like just flopping around mm-hmm. so it'll hold that that yoke shape now and, are you are you sorry, sorry okay. uh, are you allowed to um do things outside of on it or is that conflict of interest like are you allowed to collaborate and it has nothing to do with on it like if you were he were to do a project and you're like hey you know what man let's you and i create a program together and do something around this or do you keep everything in house well at my current uh, in my current state at on it is being an executive, right? So I'm really honored to have a title that doesn't exist as, any, as far as I know anywhere else. You know, if you say CFO, it means chief financial officer, right? Mm-hmm. I'm the CFO, motherfucker. Yeah. The chief fitness officer. Yeah. No, 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 the chief fitness <laughs> officer in any other company. Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to be one of the, the four horsemen, you know, the four people that kind of are running the company uh, culturally and, and, and operationally. And so for me, it is always about weighing out the the benefit to on it and you know what's really unique about on it is for the most part and people that aren't in my position we really want everybody to use on it as a platform to build a personal brand uh, we want people to be there because they want to be there and so like uh one of the guys that works for me has worked for me for these last couple of years and he's, he's we've been fighting because he's a talented hungry and fucking really like business savvy guy but we've been fighting to figure out well, what's his unique 
how can he use his superpowers to benefit the team best? And so mm-hmm. he, he's gone through this different iteration. He's our communications manager. He's evolved now to our strategic uh, partnerships. Um, like basically he's like the tip of the spear for all, all big partnerships. So Exos, I wanted, and he, he was one of our primary points of contact there. Gold's Gym because of our history, all of us. Mm-hmm. Have done. I was like, man, you know, I want to honor my history. So I, I like to work with Gold. So their corporate offices are in, in Texas. So we landed a, a their 150 corporate locations are carrying on it product. And, oh, we're, shit. and we worked with their director of education. So our, our education system has influenced something that they're, they're looking to do internally at those 150 corporate locations called Gold's Primal. And it's just good, good relationships, you know? And so uh, he's, he's presenting at D1 Sports Performance Summit uh, this weekend as a keynote speaker, which is crazy. Mm. Um, and no. so, and now he, he started a podcast called The Fitness Break Room with uh, Jessica Webster, who uh, was part of the, uh, the Barbell Shrug team before. Oh, okay. Oh, shit. And oh, so, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I met them at On It last time we were there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we met her. Yeah, we met her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Really pretty gal. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah so, um, so, so he's doing this podcast. And what's great is as the person who's, you know, a weaponized sales force for On It, he's out there building relationships. It's a lot easier for him to say, hey, do you want to be on my podcast? Then do, let's talk business about on it. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, so for, he was like, well, can I do this? And I was like, well, you know what? I'll support that as long as when everything's said and done, the prioritization has to be, you you're still a salaried employee. You still right. have to fulfill all your, your duties and obligations. But so long as you can synergistically accomplish both goals, then fuck. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's do this. I think it's good for you as a person and it's, you know, and me, I work for the people who work for me right. and I work for on it. So I'm in a unique position where I, I have to serve both of those masters. How know? many how many trainers underneath you there? At the gym? Yeah. We have about a dozen. A dozen of them? Yeah. Has it always been about that many, or did you guys grow it to that many, or you scaled it back to that many? Have you been consistent? We've grown it. We've grown it to that many. Okay. Yeah, we started with about six, and, and we've been slow growing that that team because it just takes a long time to develop. And when you have something that's really comprehensive and you have a brand that's that's respected that way is better to grow it slow and develop those people slow because when people can't deliver the deliver the service in a way that's in line with what we're putting out there in our message right then it, it, it's got to it be quality it. control yeah it is total and that's why we don't want to do affiliate gyms that's why we don't want to <clears throat> put up more on it gyms all over the place we probably will partner with some people uh, we're working on a, on a deal with a hotel in downtown Las Vegas. It's a really unique situation. It's not something that is we're incurring great costs to do, mm-hmm. and it is something that is a foothold in a place where we have cultural, you know, influence with MMA being a big part of our culture and Las Vegas being the the, the hub of any uh, major MMA events or most major MMA events. Obviously, international stuff is big these days as well. Right with a. Uh, international talent are you is the gym that the trainers that work there do they they work for you guys and then they they get paid there is that gym are you guys trying to make that gym profitable or is that just part of the whole brand and so it's not so much like let's make this a profitable gym like if you owned your own gym you know what i mean yeah it's more of an experience you know it's more of a a validation of the philosophy of training Mm -hmm. uh, because that's what it feels like it feels like it doesn't feel like because i've worked in gyms for more than half my life and it doesn't feel like you're walking into a commercial gym that's trying to bust people in and out. Yeah, or make their money because it's because it's a gym. It feels more like it's just an extension of the brand, mm-hmm. if yeah. you will. So, okay. yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately, what we've realized fitness is the uh, the marketing arm. It's the stickiness of the brand. You know, on it's got a powerful message which helps. Like, and that message has not been diluted. Uh, and then, and so, like, as far as you know, our founder's message is on its message, right? So Aubrey's message is on its message, but. You know, there's the danger of of falling out of favor with regards to anything that's cool is not cool at some point in time in their evolution. You you, you get big enough, you become more corporate, whatever the case is. Mm. And so, what what we're finding now is through fitness and fitness education, we have a stickiness to that, right? So, like we can impact lives in ways that people people if we do like an ad or something like that, we talk about fitness. It's such an easier conversation to have 
people know that they need to have a fitness regimen. They need to invest in their physical well-being through movement, a practice of movement, a practice of meditation, a practice of whatever the case is versus it's a harder sell to say like, put this in your, in your body, eat this, mm -hmm. you know? And so, so it opens the doors to new conversations. A lot of the, the big partnerships that we're, we're seeking are, are through, the, we're like, thankfully, like you guys just validated, right? Hey, we really loved, we, we held on it in even higher light because of the approach of our education and integration. And so when we talked to Exos, it was really awesome because man, I've been admiring what they've done in the market for a long, time. A long over oh, a yeah. decade. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and Mark Verstegen, you know, he just, man, that dude's a freaking amazing person, amazing businessman. And, and again, holds that same energy of if the message is consistent and is consistent through his whole organization. Um, and, and seeing how that's evolved. And I'm like, man, that's so cool. And so when I met Mark, he's like, Hey John, I've been looking forward to meeting you. I'm like, motherfucker, I've been me. I'm looking forward to meeting you, man. <laughs> Crazy, and, huh? and, and, yeah. and he's like, man, I just really love what you guys have done. That's cool. Investing in education. That's how we really started. We had this mentorship program. We didn't, we weren't making any money, but we were investing in people. And that allowed us to develop this network of talented, a talent pool mm -hmm. that as we grew, internationally or here in the U S market, we knew exactly who we wanted to tap on the shoulder because, Hey, I had, had this person in Germany for five years and then, Hey, we're opening this facility at, uh, I would call it Adidas, but it's Adidas. So, so then they knew they already had people on the ground, boots on the ground that were aligned culturally and, and method, the methodology, the systems that they applied all were part, all, all they were already on the ground using the content. So they just got to tap someone on the shoulder, put them in the place to make the win. And is because well before they could benefit from it, they invested in the development of people through their education and their mentorship programs. Oh, that's so cool, man. You, you, you mentioned that you're, one of the four horsemen, who are the other three and how often do you guys meet and talk about the direction of on it? Yeah. So every, every week, every week. So obviously Aubrey, right? right. He's the tip of the spear. He's the, the, the visionary that drove everything through on it. Right. And uh, we have our, our, then this team has evolved recently. It was a larger team. Now it's smaller. Um, so then you have our, our, our chief technology officer who is also serving right now with Aubrey to run the marketing department. And that's Josh Alley. Really, a lot of the cool, like the, the fit and finish, the way it's pre the, the the brand is presented um, in, through through the technology of the website, and even the like the cool little plugins that are created, they're all in house, they're all proprietary. So it's really been cool to see how some of the stuff that he's done on the technology side has actually influenced other larger brands to copy to copy on it in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. That's cool. It's it's because because we're not always trying to copy everyone else. We're like, oh, what if we do? you get inspired by something of someone else does and, and level it up. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's been a huge part of that. Um, and then, and then, so, mm -hmm. so you have Aubrey, our chief technology officer, our chief operating officer, who's a, a gentleman by the name of Jason Havy. Again, he has his own podcast, right. Um, spinning logic. And, and so he's just an amazing human, but he's kind of like the glue of the whole organization. He's, you know, when Aubrey's not in the office, he's the one he's, he, he's, he's the fixer. You know what I'm saying? And he oversees multiple departments because because now we're a, a, primarily a four-person leadership team and we're, we're hiring people not at the chief level. We bring them in at like a VP or, you know, even if they have a lot of, a lot of experience, right? So, and then myself. So it's a really unconventional. Yeah. It's a really unconventional structure. So, you know, everybody else, uh, what we found was like, if we had high-level leadership, if they weren't culturally aligned with the vision of the brand, then they couldn't be at that level of leadership. They could be just as powerful and impactful at a like a, a, a level that doesn't drive the culture as much, but gets shit done. Right, right. And so, you know, the level of trust and, and respect <coughs> that we have for each other as a smaller group allows us to be a little more cohesive and not have to worry about a lack of alignment in purpose or vision. And so there, it, I think it's, it's a, it's a new evolution. The company's constantly evolving and uh, it's an honor to be at the table with those, with those other three people. Oh, fuck yeah. That's know? a big deal, man. What was it that, what, what was there a, a, an event or something that happened that made you guys all come together and realize we need to narrow this down to the four of us that really, like you said, was there something that happened that made you narrow that group down? This is just natural evolution. You know what I mean? There, there was an exodus of, of a handful of people that, you know, 
a, a couple of people that were at the table and, and, uh, you know, whether that was of their own accord or, or a decision made from the rest of the leadership that it really doesn't matter. You know, those people were great people and they all contributed, but at the same time, what we just found was like the people who stayed, the people who are still there. They're, they're the ones who hold more common vision for what's, what's needs to needs to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, awesome. being in a position like that, I mean, obviously it, it comes with a lot of responsibility and there's obviously some fucking really cool parts. I mean, the fact that you get to be a part of the major decisions that happen with on, it's fucking rad in itself. But with that probably comes with some hard decisions and stress too. Is there any part that you don't like or that? Yeah, dude. You know, I think, I think leadership comes with the ultimate responsibility. You can't live in black and white, man. You, it's never clear and, and you're impacting people's lives positively or negatively with every choice you make, you know? Um, acknowledging that and still being able to, you know, make the decision that's right for the, the entity, the, the, the organism of on it. Cause it's a living, breathing thing, you know, and is driven by that, the belief, the common belief. And, and, and then also like sometimes good people are not meant to be part of that team anymore. You know, there doesn't make them less good. doesn't make them less powerful in their own right. But, um, you know, what is like, there's a, they say there's three C's of, of hiring. I don't know if you ever heard that, but I always add a fourth. So it's like, you got your character was the utmost importance of, to have someone of character when they join your team. Otherwise there's going to be really painful, but then you have secondarily, even if they're of good character, are they a culture fit? Right. Mm -hmm. And then the competence, which everybody wants to hire on competence, but it's really not nearly as important as the first two. hundred uh, percent. Cause I can teach people to do, whatever I need them to do, as long as, as a leader, I know what I want to have done. Right. right? Building mm -hmm. character is much more difficult. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, impossible. Yeah. Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Life does that for you. Yeah, and if it yeah, hasn't, then yeah. I don't want you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the fourth one is circumstance. So like it on it, we're always hiring people that are like on the uptick, you know, like they would call it hot and don't know it yet. You know, like, Oh, that guy has raw talent. He just needs to be nurtured. And, and, or this gal has just got so much potential. And so like, we want to nurture that and be part of that process. But a lot of times that means that they have to be in a position where they don't need to command like an exorbitant amount of, of money at the same time that we're trying to develop them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so like a, a lot of times in the gym, you have to bleed before we want you to be like, you have to show you're really going to be in alignment. So you have to do it, be an intern. If you're so well established um, that you, you can't do that and your ego can't take it or your pocketbook can't take it because you have too many responsibilities in life. I totally understand that. It just doesn't necessarily make you <laughs> not the right circumstance. Right. It's just not, not the right circumstance, fit. man. So, and that's okay. You know, so just acknowledging um, in so many different levels, all those things all the time, like, Oh, cause you know, you get emotionally attached when you see something in somebody you're like, I want, I want them to be part of this. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and sometimes it's just not gonna, it's not the right thing, right. you know? Well, mm -hmm. shit, man, you're a, uh, you're a pretty awesome guy. They've done a good job with you. Thanks man. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I think you're very, very valuable to, to on it. And, uh, You've got a great story, so I'm glad you came on the show. I think our audience will enjoy it. Oh, I'm excited too. We're gonna rip some good content with you Do too. Do some so, nice YouTube videos. Yeah, definitely. so we'll shoot some good videos, and and I'm sure that this uh, relationship will continue. I mean, we apps on it stood out to us, and it's really exciting to actually fight. Well, I think every time we came down there, we missed you. You know, like every, I know, yeah. every time we're there, seriously. And everybody kept saying, "You got to meet John. You John. Yeah. You and John. You guys got to meet John." Like everyone kept telling us that. Yeah. We're like, "Well, where the fuck is John at? John's never here." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bledsoe, I remember one time you guys were at Paleo Effects, and he's like, "Oh, we're gonna go do this." This, this collabo uh collabo podcast with the mind pump guys and then i was like i was kind of in the hot hot you know hot you know i was in the doghouse or something like i was like g gone too long all the time so, <laughs> so like oh yeah i'm gonna go and i call him like no 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 i'm not gonna go <laughs> he's also okay we're, we're gonna do it at like 11 p.m i'm like oh yeah definitely not gonna go. <laughs> you guys do these fucking podcast marathons when you're oh, out on the man, road right oh we go crazy, crazy. that might have been the episode does. that barbell shrug lost yeah, it, was. Yeah. it was yeah. it was that one yeah. it was, it was it mysterious was, yeah very mysterious <laughs> we tease him about that yeah we tease him all the time about that excellent man well dude we'll definitely uh for sure be in touch I look forward to the content that we're going to produce uh, right now today. And uh, I'm glad we got a chance to finally introduce you to our audience, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, guys. This has been a blast. Thanks, right on. Oh, yeah. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.